The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Advances in the Management of Non-Tuberculous Mycobacterial Lung Disease, NTMLD, Expert Insights from Dallas. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash FBD 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, I'm Dr. Dorina Drizzo Harris from NYU Langone Health. Welcome to this educational activity on emerging data on the management of non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease presented at the 2019 American Thoracic Society International Conference held in Dallas, Texas. Non-tuberculous mycobacteria are ubiquitous organisms responsible for opportunistic infections with a broad spectrum of virulence. The incidence and prevalence of NTM lung disease are increasing worldwide and rapidly becoming a major public health problem, particularly in individuals older than the age of 65, or those who have underlying structural lung disease or other host susceptibility factors. Although the distribution of NTM species varies markedly based on geography, Mycobacterium avium complex is the most common pathogen in most areas, followed by Mycobacterium abscessus. If left untreated, NTM lung disease can progress resulting in lung destruction and worsening patient quality of life. Management often consists of long-term multi-drug antibiotic regimens. Treatment can become burdensome due to adverse effects and the length of time that it is required to stay on therapy. Further, many patients do not achieve culture conversion. Last year, the FDA approved a novel once-daily treatment, amikacin liposome inhalation suspension, or ALICE, as part of a combination antibacterial drug regimen for adult patients with MAC disease who have limited or no alternative treatment options. The first few abstracts I will discuss examine possible factors associated with the inflammatory process of NTM and or host susceptibility, characteristics and phenotypes among patients with bronchiectasis, and prognostic factors associated with long-term mortality in NTM lung disease. The first study I'm going to discuss is the use of airway clearance in non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis patients. This study looks at the U.S. Bronchiectasis Research Registry and looks at over 1,300 patients. As most of us know, the most important piece of treatment in patients with bronchiectasis is to regularly perform airway clearance. There are many different types of airway clearance, and what most of us use is airway clearance that a patient is comfortable with. You can use mechanical devices, you can use exercise techniques, you can use mu mucoactive agents or nebulization treatments but it is always best to use a combination of regimens that a patient will follow. This group looked at the U.S. Bronchiectasis Research Registry to see what the use of airway clearance techniques was in this group. The data was collected in 1,320 adult patients with bronchiectasis and a productive cough. 67% of subjects utilized airway clearance techniques at baseline. Compared to those not on airway clearance techniques, subjects were more likely to use airway clearance techniques at baseline if they had experienced an exacerbation or if they had been hospitalized for a pulmonary illness in the prior two years. Of the 923 subjects with at least one year of follow-up data, only 33% of the subjects reported continued use of their airway clearance therapies at their follow-up visit. Compared to baseline, there was no significant difference in the mean change of FEV1 or FVC at one year follow-up for those on airway clearance techniques.
This study lends itself to telling us that we probably need to do a prospective trial on looking at the utility of airway clearance techniques and expand the education on airway clearance techniques to providers and patients. Clinical phenotypes among patients with bronchiectasis and NTM lung disease is becoming a very important area for research. We know that the variation in clinical phenotypes leads to differences in treatment outcomes. In this prospective study, researchers sought to characterize differences in clinical phenotype among bronchiectasis subjects with and without NTM positive cultures. These researchers from NYU looked at 91 of 118 subjects with bronchiectasis who had NTM disease based on the 2007 ATS guidelines. The remaining 27 subjects with bronchiectasis were colonized with either Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Haemophilus influenza, or Aspergillus fumigatus. Compared to bronchiectasis subjects with NTM, subjects without NTM had more pulmonary complications in the prior two years and worse quality of life on their quality of life scores compared with those in the NTM positive group. There was no difference in pulmonary function between the NTM positive or negative bronchiectasis subjects, and these differences suggest that the presence of NTM in cultures identifies a subgroup of patients with bronchiectasis that have a very different natural history of disease. The microbiome has become extremely important at looking at patients with pulmonary infections, particularly non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. This large study looked at uh, characterizing the role of oral commensals in NTM bronchiectasis patients by evaluating the microbial composition of the lower airways. Dr. Segal and his group looked at 62 subjects that had an oral wash, sputum, supraglottic, and environmental background and lower airway sampling via bronchoscopy, either through bronchiolar lavage or BAL. With the NTM subjects, 41 involved segments and 20 uninvolved segments were sampled. Two unique clusters were identified. Cluster 1 included all upper airway samples plus 32% of BAL samples, which were enriched with superglottic predominant taxa. And cluster 2 included all background samples plus 68% of BAL samples, which were enriched with background predominant taxa. The researchers compared NTM positive and NTM negative BAL samples. Mycobacteria was differently enriched in the NTM positive samples. Within BAL samples from the pneumotype SPT cluster, 79% of them were from involved samples among the NTM group. Compared to non-involved segments in the NTM positive subjects, Involved segments were enriched with oral commensals, such as Rothia, Campylobacter, and Porphyromonas, while non-involved segments tended to be enriched with Stromenopilus, Pseudomonas, and Lactobacillus. These results suggest a potential role of oral anaerobes in the inflammatory process in this disease and or host susceptibility to this pathogen. There is much more work being done in this area. Prognostic factors associated with long-term mortality in 1,445 patients with NTM lung disease was looked at in this study. Distribution of NTM patients in this group revealed that about 1,000 patients had Mycobacterium avium or intracellulare, and 300 patients had a Mycobacterium abscessus subspecies. Overall, 5, 10, and 15-year cumulative mortality rates in these patients with NTM lung disease was 12%, 24%, and 36% respectively. The following demographic and clinical factors were significantly and negatively associated with mortality in patients with NTM lung disease. Old age, male sex, low BMI, chronic infection with pulmonary aspergillosis, pulmonary or extrapulmonary malignancy, chronic heart disease, and chronic liver disease. The causative NTM organism 
with reference to Mycobacterium avian was significantly associated with mortality. When we look at Mycobacterium abscessus subspecies abscessus, the adjusted rate was 2.12. There was a slight increase with Mycobacterium intracellularity and no increase with Mycobacterium maciliense. Mortality was also significantly increased when we looked at patients with cavitary lung disease. Now let's take a look at some of the abstracts on treatment of MTM lung disease, beginning with one that examined patient reported outcomes to treatment. This study from the Northwest NTM Biobank looked at patients who were enrolled and at 12 months later who have completed an NTM module and also completed a quality of life bronchiectasis disease specific tool that measured quality of life. Of the 73 patients, 71 or 97 percent were treated for MAC and 2 percent for Mycobacterium abscessus. 58 or 79 percent of the patients had underlying bronchiectasis and 42 percent had COPD. Among starting treatment and on treatment patients, 32 of 41 completed the NTM module and 16 of 21 completed the quality of life tool. Starting treatment patients had statistically significant increases in scores for NTM symptoms, digestive symptoms, and respiratory symptoms. NTM scores increased 15 points in the 16 patients with poor scores at enrollment. Respiratory scores increased 16 points in the 12 patients with poor scores at enrollment. These results indicate that NTM respiratory and digestive symptoms all improved during the first 12 months of treatment. You can see on this graph that the NTM symptoms, digestive symptoms, and respiratory symptoms improved significantly. This study looks at a review of the local prevalence and management of NTM lung disease in the UK. Patient details were obtained for all positive NTM isolates over 15 years in the UK. 147 NTM patient isolates from pulmonary and extrapulmonary sites were identified. 90 pulmonary isolates were considered for further analysis. 33 of the 90 patients received treatment with greater than three drugs in 19 of the cases, two or less drugs in 13 of the cases, and one case data was unavailable. 63% were treated for greater than 18 months, and 37% were treated less than 18 months. 25 of the 90 met microbiologic and radiologic criteria for treatment. 60% of the group was treated, whereas a third were not. MAC was the most prevalent type of NTM treated. In this group, 87% of the patients had underlying lung disease, either COPD or bronchiectasis. From this graph, we can see that MAC was the most common cause of extrapulmonary disease as well as pulmonary lung disease. But you can also see that there was a spectrum of other NTM involved in both extrapulmonary and pulmonary disease in this cohort. This group looked at the clinical characteristics and outcomes of patients undergoing antimycobacterial therapy versus no antimycobacterial therapy for MAC lung disease. One of the most difficult questions that we have to decide is which patients should we treat with antimycobacterial therapy. The first line of therapy is often adding airway clearance techniques. It is difficult to determine at times whether or not anti-mycobacterial therapy will enhance culture conversion over airway clearance techniques alone. This group tried to answer that question. Patients were excluded if they did not meet ATS criteria for MAC, did not follow up, if they were immunocompromised, if they had extra pulmonary MAC, or if they had been previously treated for MAC. 28 patients met criteria. 24 of these patients had fibronodular disease, while four had fibrocavitary disease. Of the 24 with fibronodular disease, 13 were treated with antimycobacterial therapy and 11 were not. 
At the end of the follow-up, six patients who received antibacterial therapy and five patients who did not were asymptomatic, equal percentages in both groups. Respiratory culture clearance occurred in all patients treated with antimycobacterial therapy at an average of 10.4 months. Among patients who did not receive antimycobacterial therapy, three patients continued to have positive respiratory cultures at 24 months, but five patients achieved culture clearance and again, these patients were not receiving antimycobacterial therapy. Return to culture positivity occurred in three of the 13 patients treated with antimycobacterial therapy and three of the five who did not receive therapy, demonstrating that relapse and reinfection are common in both groups. These results, however, suggest that observation and bronchial hygiene may be appropriate therapy in selected patients with fibronodule bronchiectatic MAC. We know that patients who are being treated with guideline-based therapy often have side effects. One of the more common complications is optic neuritis from ethambutol therapy. This group looked at using lower doses of ethambutol to reduce the incidence of ocular toxicity without compromising the efficacy for MAC lung disease. It was a retrospective review, and it consisted of 63 patients with MAC lung disease who were treated with standard guideline-based therapy, a combination of macrolide, rifamycin, and ethambutol for the first time. In this group, 50% of the patients had nodular bronchiectasis, and 43% had fibro fibrocavitary disease. 13% of the patients failed to achieve sputum conversion during therapy, leading us to know that 87% did achieve sputum conversion, which is excellent results. Ethambutol in this study was discontinued because of visual symptoms in 22% of the patients. After further investigation, six of these 14 patients were subsequently diagnosed with ethambutol optic neuropathy. Visual symptoms developed after a median of 23 months of ethambutol therapy, proving that this side effect can happen quite far into the treatment of patients with MAC lung disease. Dose per day was significantly higher in patients who developed optic neuropathy, 16.2 milligrams per kilogram per day versus 12.4 milligrams per kilogram per day. No patients given ethambutol at a dose of 12.5 milligrams per kilogram per day or lower developed optic neuropathy. The failure of sputum conversion was not significantly different between the two dosed groups. This study lends us to believe that perhaps 12.5 milligrams per kilogram per day or lower is adequate in treating patients with guideline-based therapy. Larger studies looking at this specific question are warranted. This study looks at in vitro activity of two new tetracycline analogs aravacycline and omatacycline. In this study, these tetracyclines were used against drug-resistant Mycobacterium abscessus clinical isolates. The aim of the study was to evaluate the in vitro activity of these two oral new tetracyclines. In the study, the MICs were compared to tigacycline which is a standard IV therapy that we currently use for Mycobacterium abscessus. The MIC50 and MIC90 of aravacycline were lower than those for tigacycline and omatacycline. These findings suggest that the newly approved drugs have an in vitro activity against comparable tigacycline and may be useful in highly drug-resistant Mycobacterium bacterium abscessus isolates. If we look at this MIC distribution graph, we can see that there is no formal breakpoint. 
and that in tigacycline, the breakpoint is proposed in the range of 0.5 to 4. This study looked at the synergistic effect of nitric oxide with antibiotics against Mycobacterium abscessus in vitro. The study investigated the effect of high-dose nitric oxide combined with clofazamine against clinical isolates of M. abscessus. Clofazamine at highest concentration showed very limited activity against Mycobacterium abscessus at 10 hours. However, a concentration-dependent enhancement of clofazamine activity was observed in the presence of 250 parts per million nitric oxide. The combination of high-dose nitric oxide and five times MIC clofazamine demonstrated multiple log reductions in B1, B5, B8, and MRD-CFU, respectively compared to clofazamine alone. This graph shows the findings that show a potential role for high-dose nitric oxide in combination with clofazamine in treatment of patients with mycobacterium abscessus. More work is being done in this area. This describes the use of mesenchymal stem cell therapy and chronic NTM infection. This group used the marine model of cystic fibrosis and inflammation. The researchers tested the hypothesis that treatment with human mesenchymal stem cells will decrease the course of NTM infection. They used a conditioned medium from human mesenchymal stem cells grown for 72 hours without antibiotics and found a decrease in NTM CFUs that was statistically significant compared to non-treated NTM controls. This novel technology and in vivo modeling system holds promise in providing a detailed look into the host response to NTM pathogens and development of human mesenchymal stem cell therapies in the future. The next few abstracts will focus on ALICE, amicacin liposome inhalation suspension, which as I previously mentioned was FDA approved in 2018 as part of a combination antibacterial regimen in adults with refractory mycobacterium avium complex lung disease and limited or no other treatment options. The first study I will discuss regarding ALICE is the sustainability and durability of culture conversion in patients with treatment refractory NTM lung disease receiving ALICE, the CONVERT trial. As you may remember, in the initial publication of the CONVERT trial, there was a significant increase in culture conversion in patients who were in the ALICE plus guideline-based treatment arm versus guideline-based treatment alone. 29% versus 8.9% achieved culture conversion. This study looks at the ongoing effect of ALICE in sustaining culture negativity in these patient groups. It also looked at post-treatment analysis of patients who had been on ALICE. Adults with refractory radiographically confirmed MAC were randomized to either ALICE plus guideline-based treatment or guideline-based treatment alone. Patients who had achieved culture conversion, which is three consecutive monthly MAC negative sputum cultures by month six, continued in their assigned treatment for 12 months from initial conversion defining negative sputum culture. Patients were followed 12 additional months post-treatment. In patients who converted by month six and continued treatment, sputum negativity was sustained for 12 months after conversion in 63% of patients receiving ALICE plus the guideline-based treatment, and only in 30% of the patients on guideline-based treatment alone. When we looked at these patients after they finished treatment, Three months post-treatment, 63% of patients who had been in the ALICE plus guideline-based therapy arm were still sputum negative, whereas no patient in the guideline-based therapy arm alone was still sputum negative. Exposure to ALICE following the initial primary endpoint safety analysis did not alter findings from the original report. 
This last paper looked at the addition of ALICE to current therapy in patients with m abscessus lung disease. This is a phase two, open label, ongoing trial that looked at the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of ALICE in both treatment refractory and treatment naive patients with Mycobacterium abscessus lung disease. Patients were assigned to ALICE once daily, and this was added to their companion medication regimen for 12 months. The primary endpoint of this study was the proportion of patients achieving culture conversion, which was defined as three consecutive monthly negative sputum cultures. Of the nine patients that had cystic fibrosis, 44% converted, with half of those patients either relapsing or getting reinfected. Of the 24 patients who did not have cystic fibrosis, 29% converted without reversion, and another 8% converted, but then reverted, either relapsed or had reinfection. In the patients that were on oral antibiotics, compared to those that were on oral antibiotics and IV antibiotics at the same time, there were culture conversion rates between a quarter and a third of the patients. In the oral antibiotic group, 17% of the patients relapsed or reinfected after they had converted. And in the IV and oral antibiotic group, 8% of the patients either relapsed or rein were reinfected after they converted. The most common adverse events were pulmonary exacerbations followed by dysphonia. And this is not surprising, as this was seen in the ALICE trial when used in patients with MAC disease. To date, 43% of the patients receiving ALICE for Mycobacterium abscessus lung disease for at least four months met sputum conversion criteria, which is very encouraging since these patients had very difficult to treat Mycobacterium abscessus lung disease. We saw that 13% of these patients reverted while on therapy, but just the fact that we were able to achieve 43% sputum conversion initially is very, very encouraging. More work of using ALICE in M. abscessus will be ongoing. In conclusion, the abstracts presented at ATS show that research in NTM lung disease continues to evolve. In terms of understanding its inflammatory process and host susceptibility, clinical characteristics and phenotypes, prognostic factors, and in treatment, especially as novel therapies continue to emerge and study of their application to other strains of NTM continues. The availability of novel Alternative treatment options offer promise to improve outcomes for patients with NTM lung disease who previously had limited therapeutic options. And we look forward to seeing more data emerge. That ends our discussion for today. I hope you have found it informative and useful. Thank you very much for participating. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash FBD 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from INSMED.